All right, hello everybody. Um, my name's Chris. Today I'm going to be presenting to you a talk called Behind the Curtains of Making Real Consumer Devices Using Debian. Um, I'm an engineer at Calabra. Um, I specialise in the integration of boards and integration of um, customer devices into sort of Debian systems, um, continuous integration of those systems and kind of packaging software that kind of thing. Um, so if you have any questions about those sorts of things, feel free to ping me using the email that you've got on the screen at the moment. Um, so basically this presentation is really for people who've got some hardware, uh, whether that's a development board or a final board. They've got an app running and they're missing the piece in the middle, the kind of software stack that runs everything, the embedded Linux, all of that integrated together. Um, so I'll be talking today in two parts. The first part, I'll be talking about the process that I use to bring up a new board. It doesn't matter whether that's which vendor the system on chips buy or anything like that. Um, it's kind of agnostic to all of that. And in the second part, I'll be going through some specific, more specific bits that we use for some projects, um, really with Debian and kind of all the bits that go around that. So continuous integration of the system, how we make it secure, that kind of thing. Um, I've also done some previous talks on DevOS, which is the tool we use to create images, specifically Debian images, but also looking at, it's kind of a generic tool, so it will work for any kind of image you want to create. So we've got some patches at the moment that are being written to run for Arch Linux, so you can build Arch Linux boxes um, so please do see those previous presentations for that because that is kind of a prerequisite for this. Um, and also we've got the famous question that we're going to be answering today. We've got the hardware, we've got the app, how hard could it possibly be in between? Uh, the short answer is very hard, but hopefully the tips I'll be giving you today will help with that process. So really the first thing that you want to decide on before you start hacking or getting involved with anything is you really want to sort out the requirements of what the product actually wants to do. So you want to find the SOC or the system on chip you're interested in. You want to make sure that the peripherals you care about actually work properly. They've all got the right kind of parameters involved. Um, and also you want to be very clear from the early day what the performance requirements are of your app and the product. Uh, because there's a lot of chips nowadays that are very slow clock speeds so you just want to make sure that everything's going to run nicely there. I would also highly recommend getting some SOC development kits. I mean I've been through a few dev kits, blown them up, that kind of thing in the past. Um, so it's useful to have one and if a spare if you can for each member of your team or maybe the spare would just be like spare, not one spare for each. You want to get as much stuff from the vendor as possible, so you want to make sure they've got all the BSP. Uh, usually that will be like an image that has been created by the vendor. Um, if you're lucky, you'll also get some source code. So that, that is also very quite nice. You can get the source code as well as a pre-built image. You're also going to want to get as much reference material, so schematics, SOC data sheets, as you physically can get your hands on. Uh, also, I recommend saving all of this information in a place where everyone can access it. So, um, we at Collabora use Nextcloud. We find Nextcloud is great because we can just create an account for somebody and let them log in and download the files as necessary. Um, also, a really important thing is to kind of get yourself a tech contact at the, S at the vendor, um, whether that's the SOM or SOC vendor, because they can be really useful in helping to track down any problems that you may have. Uh, with any of the technical requirements or any of the um, issues that you may come up with and yeah there are normally loads of issues so it's always good to get someone who's really hands-on at the vendor uh, so basically the next thing we're going to talk about is what a BSP is obviously BSP stands for board support package uh, but this could be one of many different things so I mean I've seen BSPs that are normally just built images um, ideally you'd like some source code, some build scripts, Yocto layers, 
Android source dump anything like that to try and get your hands on. Um, but I do like to get a pre-built image as well as all of that so that at least you can verify the pre-built image works. Uh, inside all of this stuff you'll have a bootloader, a kernel, uh, some rootfs, whether that's pre-built rootfs or maybe a script that calls something like dbootstrap to build a Debian OS, uh, something like Yocto that, or build root that builds everything, um, and then all the scripts and things that go along with that documentation of how to get it running. Um, usually with any kernel you may get or bootloader, it's usually going to be quite an old release. Um, it's going to be going to have some patches on it downstream that will be of questionable quality. I mean in some cases I've seen vendors that do really good stuff. I've also seen some vendors that don't do so good. So really I tend to want to choose the SOC based on how good the vendor is um, and how good the BSP is but in some cases you may just be stuck with it because of time or cost concerns. Usually it's because the cheap BSP or the cheap vendor has got a terrible BSP so you're stuck with it so unfortunately for you. Um, I mean it's not as simple as that but I think generally that is how things work so um, it's quite generic advice there really but at least try and get as much information as possible um, and like I say the pre-built image is really what I think is the most important thing because then you can validate that everything works without having to compile anything um, what I also tend to do is document how to flash that I mean in most cases you would flash it to an SD card but in other cases more recently this sort of thing's happening where you flash it over a custom USB protocol um, it's always good to document how to build that flasher software and how to run that flasher software to flash the board not only this will this help later in the factory build process but it will also help other members of the team get started quicker so the first thing that you're going to want to do after flashing that image is obviously try and run the board see what happens um, Hopefully you'll get some sort of shell on a serial port. Uh, maybe you might even get a display, an X11 system on the HDMI port or a touch screen. That would be very nice if you could get that. Um, what I then tend to do is play around with everything, verify that things all work as expected, the drivers for the peripherals that you're going to be using just kind of work okay and get things running there as well as document how to do all of that stuff. If you don't do this early, you're going to be stabbing in the dark later when you try and get things running on mainline kernels. So I highly recommend getting things running in the BSP early rather than leaving it until too late. Um, I tend to want to spend a week or so getting the BSP running, um, getting everything running on the BSP to try and just get things running in a dirty environment, to be honest. Um, so then that brings us on to our next step, which is replacing things. So you've got this BSP image of theirs running and you kind of want to start putting your app on it and replacing the bad stuff with potentially some mainline stuff, if possible, or at least something that you can compile yourself. So the first thing I always do is analyze the partition layout, whether that's on device or analyzing the actual image itself um, that comes out of the BSP or kind of just a mixture of the two really. Um, a top tip here, you can either mount the image on your local machine using loopback devices and all of that stuff um, which is quite a pain but you could also use Fake Machine which is the library DevOS uses to create its virtual machine to mount the image and then you can do all sorts of scripted things on that BSP image inside Fake Machine. Um, normally what I tend to do is extract all of the binary blobs from that image. So the bootloader, the kernel, um, even the root FS. I'll just extract it all somewhere. And then I will stitch that back together using a DevOS recipe um, to actually create my own version of that image, even though it's using the binary blobs from the BSP and this is quite simple really because 
you then have an image that you've created yourself with the correct partition layout um, and you can then verify that that image works just fine and the partition layout's all okay and everything before you go any further. And then we tend to do a replacement approach known as a top-down replacement approach. So what we tend to do is replace the root file system first with something like a very basic Debian, um, maybe Debian Unstable release or something like that um, using DevOS. Um, we tend to use Debian because it's quite mature and the processes make sure that the system is stable and very secure, the, the process inside of Debian. Um, so basically we use DevOS to run the bootstrap action and app to actually install Debian itself, very basic system. Then we'll use the apt actions to actually install packages in there that are relevant. So then we'll also use the run and overlay actions in DevOS to actually run scripts inside the rootfs, copy files in, that kind of thing. Just a real basic system that we can get a shell to or maybe even a X or Western system. And then we'll make sure that all runs OK and everything's all happy still with the replaced root file system. And then the next thing I like to do is to build the BSP kernel and other things in the BSP myself, so the bootloader maybe. Um, normally this will require an older compiler as well for some vendors, so I like to get all of that done first. Um, I wouldn't do this in CI, I would want to do all this on the local desktop with excuse me, with some documentation around it to ensure that anyone in the future could do the same things well if needed. Um, then if you want to get some extra credit, you can replace the bootloader with the bootloader built yourself. Um, sometimes it's worth just sticking with binary blobs for the bootloader in some cases, like the first and second stage bootloaders. Um, and then also you would want to rebase the kernel patches um, and the bootloader patches. This isn't for the faint of heart, I mean as an integration engineer myself I would really enlist the help of a kernel engineer to help with this task so I mean I would prefer to give that task to somebody else to, to get on with that knows a lot more about the kernel especially on, these, on this specific chip. Um, I'd also want to make sure that I chose a stable kernel release to base those patches on. Um, so really all of that is going to be quite hard work, I think trudging work I call it, so it's like the hard stuff that, that takes a lot of the effort. But that after you've done that you'll have a custom image. So that's really good. You can stop there if you really want because that's part one of the presentation finished um, but now you have that custom image the hard part is then actually making that custom image into a product so you have a basic kind of image and then a lot of people will stop at that stage and say right the product's done but actually there's a lot of things that we haven't yet thought about including continuous integration security actually packaging the application to run on the system, upgrades of the system, uh, chain of trust, security updates, automated testing, factory provisioning and lots of other things. So we'll cover all of that in this next part. So integration in CI, I mean continuous integration is a really important thing for us at least when we're building customer projects because we have a lot of different engineers who would be working on the same product, having to download all the tooling and all of the right cross compilers and things like that would be a mess. So really we decide early to create continuous integration. We use GitLab for it, but you could use other things like GitHub or Azure DevOps, Jenkins, that kind of thing. Um, but we, we decide to push all the scripts up early into continuous integration so you've got a really nice base to start with. So yeah, you can build the DevOS recipes at least in all of these things, GitHub's, GitHub Actions, GitLab CI, your DevOps, Jenkins, you can even build it on your local machine, which is quite nice because DevOS actually abstracts all of the things away so that it doesn't matter where you run it, 
it should be a very similar environment each time. Running on a system like GitLab CI also gives you lots of other fun features. So you can set up schedules to run nightly builds that are, that are done automatically. Uh, you can have merge requests so other members of the team can actually do merges um, and be reviewed by people. So you've got like a proper process there. You can add tags to releases, loads of other things. The same sort of thing you get when you have a software project in Git, you can do all of the same sorts of things. Um, also the really nice thing that I like here is we've got um, chat integration and email integration. So anytime build fails, the right people get no notified and we can sort out the right people to get, sort it out. So as well, an important thing to look at is security. So you want to lock down the serial ports on the device. This is both in the bootloader as well as the OS itself. So you don't want people to be able to interrupt the boot process and write their own commands in and launch their own things. You also don't want people to be able to go on the serial port and get a Linux console. So it's always worth checking all the serial ports, even the ones that aren't actually broken out to the user so I mean most SSCs now have got multiple serial ports it's worth checking all of them and making sure they're all locked down also it's worth um, disabling any debug services or any factory installation things um, SSH is a common one really common to have SSH enabled in um, in these systems so really nice just to close all of that down make sure that no one can get in um, so then we want to go on to packaging your application I mean there's a big thing these days uh, where people are packaging their apps in containers so docker containers uh, so they can run on sort of any machine um, there's also the camp who run their software still on the native side I mean native software is much more likely to happen if you've got drivers or things inside your software that talks more closely to the hardware um, it's really your choice I mean docker these days you can just install docker and everything just works really well um, we use OBS to build Debian packages from customer software and apps and we store the source code in GitLab so OBS is open build service from SUSE it's a very good bit of software to build things because it builds all the dependencies that the software needs in the right order and also it creates app repositories which then we use an image building process to pull down the image um, so everything really is quite nice there I think so then we've got over the air upgrades um, so obviously systems these days are normally thrown out the door as soon as the basic kind of software features work and then we upgrade iteratively with new features over time so these days secure and validated upgrades are really important so what we don't want is we don't want someone to install a random bit of update on the system we also don't want someone to get halfway through the update and then brick the device by resetting the power or something like that all of these are really things that we don't want um, in the past the upgrades would have happened with an apt repository or a script something like that like a cron job called an apt but these days we can do a lot better um, what I tend to recommend is AB upgrades so if you don't know an AB system has got two slots in the EMMC or SD card or wherever you're storing your image. Um, each slot contains an app and the bootloader then chooses which one of these slots to boot based on the last time it started up. And then once the system started your application then triggers the upgrade at the right time you know after it's connected to GSM or whatever um, and then triggers the reboot when the updates finished into the new slot this is very nice because you've always got one slot that works so to a user um, it will be as if the product 
the product will never not work as long as the bootloader handles it correctly. So you can roll back to the old slot in case the upgrade fails. Um, downside to this is it requires more EMMC space but it's not really that much of a problem I don't think because storage space can be quite cheap these days. Um, you can get you know, in the order of 16 or 32 gig systems are quite cheap now and also we can trim down root file systems to be really small in the order of around 500 meg to a gig so I don't really see that as a problem in most systems so we've been using OS tree and RALC um, for upgrades I tend to prefer using RALC um, because it's very extensible and it lets you do these AV upgrades or really choose how you do your upgrade which I think makes route quite a nice system. We can integrate both of these into DevOS so the same recipe that generates the actual image that you flash to the device you can use to create an upgrade image. Um, you can sign the updates so this is very secure make sure that so long as no one can access the console they can't just install a random update from anywhere uh, which is very nice. The updates, you can also encrypt the route bundles as well. And also optionally you can use CA Sync, which allows you to install chunks of an update and also only download what has changed on the system. So although the image may be 500 meg, um, you can just install the bits that have changed, which may even be in the order of megabytes. This is really useful when you're on GSM connections. Although these days those connections are really high bandwidth and also they're quite cheap to transfer over so it's really one of these things that you have to decide based on the application. <clears throat> so then we get to the chain of trust so secure boot is very useful on some x86 platforms so long as the BIOS vendor has actually implemented everything properly. Um, it may not be in some BSP bootloaders, uh, it might be a mess to implement, so I don't really have an answer on this one really, apart from going for a vendor who actually has got secure boot with their platform all kind of sorted nicely. And it's something to check in the early days really before you choose a SOC or system on chip. Um, what we like to do is we like to convert the root file system to read only. Um, this has got a lot of issues because things like systemd place some files in etc directory which need to be right um, but after you've created that read only file system you can then hash it with dm verity and make sure that the system that's being booted is the system that you think is going to be booted which is quite a nice thing to do so that no one's tampered with the operating system or the root fs you can also use OverlayFS on top of these read-only systems uh, on another partition for things like the configuration files. So you can actually insert a configuration into ETC or wherever else that the user may need to change. Um, and if all of that stuff doesn't work, so the, the Verity checksum or whatever doesn't actually perform at runtime, then you can just not load the app and then you're sure that the system has been modified then. <coughs> Excuse me. So long lifetime or security updates. So really the main thing here is the kernel. So going back to my original point of the fact that we wanna try and port your patches onto a stable kernel rather than using the BSP kernel because the mainline Linux kernel is continuously evolving. The BSP kernel unfortunately never really tracks that unless you're very lucky. So what we like to do is we like to port it to a long-term stable kernel, which is usually supported for five or more years. Um, the current long-term stable is 5.10. Um, so it's always nice to, to use a stable kernel because then bug fixes and security patches <coughs> <clears throat> excuse me, are flowing from the mainline kernel into that stable kernel. So these stable kernels are released really often. In some, some cases they're released weekly, 
and so on. So they're, they're, you could even set up an automated pipeline to pull that stable kernel and either ping the main, your internal maintainers to actually do the upgrade or you could also do the rebase automatically as part of that. Um, that's an option. So then really we go into automated testing. So at Collabora we've got Lava, uh, we've got a Lava Lab which contains loads of dev kits, loads of custom boards and we also use that for things like kernel CI which I'm sure you've heard about which tests nightly kernels to make sure that there are no kind of regressions on real hardware which is very nice. But Lava allows you to flash an image or a kernel to a board, run some tests and report back whether the test has passed or failed. So you can set up email notifications so that if the test fails you can again send that to the right people who know what needs to be done to fix the board or fix the issue. Uh, we can also submit these test jobs automatically through GitLab. So when a new nightly build, for instance, is run, uh, we can then run the tests automatically on those nightly builds and then providing that that works, you could potentially decide to automatically push that image out to Im boards in the field. Um, that would need a little bit more thinking about because I think a manual test is kind of a good thing really just to make sure things are working because automated tests are only as good as the tests that you've written. So when we factory provision these items we tend to set up a separate PC completely to flash images. Um, we would tend to flash the same image as you're flashing to the board and have a separate script in that image to do the flashing. Um, and then the idea is when the when the board turns on it would then run a custom script to do things like setting up serial numbers that kind of thing using the PC that you've got set up next to it to kind of save everything in a database so you can go as simple or as complicated as you like here um, yeah so really the answer to we've got the hardware we've got our app how hard could it possibly be is it's as hard as you want to make it. If you do things properly in the first place, the first time you do things may be quite difficult, but then each product that you design through that then gets easier and easier. Um, that was quite a high level overview of each of individual pieces, but we've gone for half an hour now and my time slot's only 40 minutes, so if you've got any specific questions, um, please do ask below and I'll hopefully follow up at the next uh, conference with any specifics that may have come from this presentation or any common points. Uh, if any of the above that I've spoken about sounds like something that you'd want to work on with interesting customer projects, um, Collabora are hiring so if you follow the link in this um, slide you can see that our job opportunities. We've got all sorts up so please do take a look there. Um, and finally, I'd like to say thank you and take any questions. Thanks.